Well, following the precepts of this characteristic accolade, we derive a further test of the sincerity of those who denounce the totalitarian Sandinistas. Just at the time that La Prensa was suspended in 1986, after the virtual declaration of war by Congress, Israel permanently closed two Jerusalem newspapers. The grounds were that, I'm quoting, although we offer them freedom of expression, it is forbidden to permit them to exploit this freedom in order to harm the state of Israel. The Interior Ministry declared that it was compelled to act in the interest of state security and public welfare. We believe in freedom of the press, the ministry asserted, but one has to properly balance freedom of expression and the welfare of the state. The closure was upheld by the High Court on the grounds that it is inconceivable that the state of Israel should allow terrorist organizations which seek to destroy it to set up businesses in its territory, legitimate as they may be. The government had accused these two Arab newspapers of receiving support from hostile groups. As La Prensa was reopened in 1987, the Israeli press reported the closing of a political journal in Nazareth on grounds of its extreme nationalist editorial line. An Arab-owned news office in Nablus was shut down on the charge of support for the PLO. The Israeli High Court upheld the closing of the Nazareth Journal, alleging that the security services had provided evidence of a connection between the journal and terrorist organizations. The court dismissed as irrelevant the plea of the publisher that everything that had appeared in the journal had passed through Israeli censorship. None of this was reported. New York Times correspondent Thomas Friedman chose the day of the closing of the Nablus office to produce one of his regular odes to freedom of expression in Israel. There was no outcry of protest among American civil libertarians, no denunciation or even comment on acts that far exceed the harassment and temporary suspension of the U.S.-funded journal in Nicaragua that openly supports the overthrow of the government. Once again, history has contrived a controlled experiment to demonstrate the utter contempt for freedom of speech on the part of professed civil libertarians. In the United States, one will discover very little reference to the severe constraints on free expression in Israel over many years. It was not until the violent reaction to the Palestinian uprising from December 1987 that even cursory notice was taken of these practices. In the New York Times, there had been virtually nothing. It requires considerable audacity for former chief editor A.M. Rosenthal to assert in May 1988 that censorship in Israel deserves and gets Western criticism. Furthermore, the rare exceptions to the general silence on these matters do not lead to condemnations for these departures from our high ideals, and they do not lead to a call for some action on the part of Israel's leading patron. The reaction of the U.S. media and the American intellectual community to Israeli law and practices provides further dramatic evidence that the show of concern for civil liberties and human rights in Nicaragua is cynical pretense serving other ends. Noam Chomsky will be back at the end of tonight's program with some concluding remarks to these 1988 CBC Massey Lectures. Several weeks ago, Professor Chomsky talked to an audience at Ryerson Polytechnical Institute in Toronto on this subject of media, propaganda and democracy. Afterwards, he was questioned by a panel of Canadian journalists, and we've been presenting parts of that public discussion this week. This is reporter and filmmaker Kevin McMahon. It's my impression that most of the population feels that it's being propagandized and, and they turn more and more towards the, um, using media as strictly a source of entertainment. You know, it's a postman idea about it doesn't really matter what they say because they say it so stupidly that, uh, that you know, people are just consuming it for a laugh. And, and I wonder if now that doesn't become more of a problem really than propaganda. I mean, p y despite the really impressive evidence that you amass, um, I don't think you, you know, most people would be convinced by a couple of sentences saying we're propagandized. And uh, so, yeah, I wonder if, if entertainment isn't, isn't really the greater problem now. Yeah. 
I think you're, what you said is very important. What I've been talking about gives a kind of a skewed picture. I maybe should have emphasized more, but remember, I'm talking about the elite media. The elite media, and there's, the elite media target largely educated people. They target the political class, the more or less politically active class, a pretty small percentage of the population, the articulate elite intellectuals. And that's the kind of propaganda I've been talking about, and that's only a small part of the system. Uh, things have to be done for the rest of the population, too. They have to be marginalized, but they're not going to be marginalized by uh, telling them uh, lies about foreign policy, because just as you say, they don't believe most of what they read. There's just a kind of a general populist skepticism, along with this sense that the government is run by a few big interests looking out for themselves, is the sense that the media are probably lying to us. Uh, so for most of the population, the media system is, I think, a different one. It's not just the case that it tries to entertain them. It tries to entertain them through means which will intensify attitudes that support the interests of elites. So you want, for example, let me give some cases. Uh, take the emphasis on professional sports. Now, uh, the, it sounds harmless, but it really isn't. Professional sports are a way of building up jingoist fanaticism. Uh, you're supposed to cheer for your own team. I, to mention something from personal experience. I remember very well myself when I was, I guess, a high school student, sudden revelation, you know, when I asked myself, why am I cheering for my high school football team? <laughs> I don't know anybody on it. If I met anybody on it, I'd probably hate each other. You know, why do I care whether they win or if some guy a couple blocks away wins? Well, you know, uh, and then you could say the same thing about, you know, the baseball team or whatever else it is. Uh, this idea of cheering for your home team, which you mentioned before, that's a way of building into people irrational uh, submissiveness to power. You know? And it's a very dangerous thing. And I think that's one of the reasons it's such a big, it's, it's, it gets such a huge play. Uh, or t let's move to something else. The indoctrination that's done by TV and so on is not trying to pile up evidence and give arguments and so on. It's trying to inculcate attitudes mentioned a couple of cases, but there are a lot more. Let's take, say, the bombing of Libya. Why did the American public support the bombing of Libya? Well, the reason is that there had been a very effective and careful and intense inculcation of racist attitudes about Arabs. I mean, anti-Arab racism is the one form of racism in the United States that's considered legitimate. I mean, plenty of people are racists, but you don't like to admit it. You know. On the other hand, with regard to anti-Arab racism, you admit it openly. I mean, you read a journal like, say, The New Republic, and what the kinds of things that they say about Arabs, uh, if anybody said them about Jews, you'd think you're reading Der Stürmer. You know? I'm, I'm not joking. And nobody notices it, you know? because Arab anti-racism is so profound. It shows up in literature. I mean, there are, there are novels that have a form of anti-Arab racism that's hair-raising. You know, same is true of television shows and so on and so forth. Uh, an image has been created uh, through, throughout a lot of the, the media are part of this, not all, uh, of, uh, you know, the Arab terrorists lurking out there ready to kill us. And against that background, you could bomb Libya and people would cheer. Uh, recall how effective that was. Remember what was happening in 1986. There are a lot of measures of how effective this is. Remember that in 1986, when this happened, the tourism industry in Europe was virtually wiped out because Americans were afraid to go to Europe, where incidentally, objectively, they would be about 100 times as safe as in any American city. That's no joke. But they were afraid to go to Europe because they got these Arab terrorists out there trying to kill us. You know? Now, that was not from New York Times editorials. That was from a whole array of television and novels and soap operas and, you know, massive symbolism and so on and so forth. And that's effective. I mean, that's uh, the anti-communist hysteria has developed that way, too. The communists are out there ready to kill us. Who are the communists? I don't know. You know, they're out there ready to kill us. You know, this is introduced by the kinds of symbolism the TV is good at and cheap novels are good at and so on. And that's important. You know, that's, these are critical means of indoctrination. It's just that I wasn't talking about them. I was talking about the more intellectual side. Noam Chomsky, who continues now with his concluding remarks in the 1988 CBC Messy Lectures about media, propaganda, and democracy. <laughs>
Discussing what he called our unfree press half a century ago, John Dewey observed that criticism of specific abuses has only limited value. He wrote that the only really fundamental approach to the problem is to inquire concerning the necessary effect of the present economic system upon the whole system of publicity, upon the judgment of what news is, upon the selection and elimination of matter that is published, upon the treatment of news in both editorial and news columns. The question, under this mode of approach, is not how many specific abuses there are and how they may be remedied, but how far genuine intellectual freedom and social responsibility are possible on any large scale under the existing economic regime. Publishers and editors, with their commitments to the public and social order of which they are the beneficiaries, will often prove to be among the chief enemies of true liberty of the press, Dewey continued. They are among the leaders and the henchmen of big business, and they will select and treat their special wares from this standpoint. Insofar as the ideological managers are giving the public what it wants, that is because of the effect of the present economic system in generating intellectual indifference and apathy, in creating a demand for distraction and diversion among a public that is debauched by the ideal of getting away with whatever it can. All of these are Dewey's words. To these apt reflections, we may add the intimate relations between private and state power, the institutionally determined need to accommodate to the interests of those who control basic social decisions, and the success of established power in steadily disintegrating any independent culture, fostering values other than greed, personal gain, and subordination to authority, and any popular forms that sustain independent thought and action. Within the reigning social order, the general public must remain an object of manipulation, not a participant in thought, debate, and decision. I have discussed some of the ways these principles have been expressed in the modern period, but the concerns are natural and have arisen from the very origins of the democratic thrust. Condemning the radical Democrats, who had threatened to turn the world upside down during the English Revolution of the 17th century, Historian Clement Walker in 1661 complained that they have cast all the mysteries and secrets of government before the vulgar, like pearls before swine, and have taught both the soldiery and the people to look so far into them as to ravel back all governments to the first principles of nature. They have made the people thereby so curious and so arrogant that they will never find humility enough to submit to a civil rule. Walker's concerns were soon overcome, as an orderly world was restored and the political defeat of the Democrats was total and irreversible, as historian Christopher Hill observes. By 1695, censorship could be abandoned, not on the radicals' libertarian principles, but because censorship was no longer necessary for the opinion formers now censored themselves, and nothing got into print, which frightened the men of property, again quoting Christopher Hill. In the same year, 1695, John Locke wrote that day laborers and tradesmen, the spinsters and dairymaids, must be told what to believe. The greatest part cannot know, and therefore they must believe. With the decline of religious authority in the modern period, the task has fallen to the secular priesthood, who understand their responsibility with some clarity as I have already discussed. The manipulation of the public in the 1960s elicited the concerns expressed by Senator Fulbright that I quoted last night when he described the media as adjuncts of government. A year later, law professor Jerome Barron proposed what he called an interpretation of the First Amendment which focuses on the idea that restraining the hand of government is quite useless in assuring free speech if a restraint on access is effectively secured by private groups that alone can lay sentiments before the public. As a constitutional theory for the communication of ideas, laissez-faire is manifestly irrelevant, he said, when the media are narrowly controlled by private power. In reality, 
only those media that consistently restrict both sides to the narrow spectrum of elite consensus will succeed in the guided free market. It is particularly important to understand what stories not to seek. Refugees from Timor or from U.S. bombing in Laos and Cambodia have no useful tales to tell. It is important to stay away from camps on the Honduran border, where refugees will report the atrocities of the forces we organize, train, and supply. It would be bad form to arouse public awareness of Nicaragua's noteworthy progress in the social sector, which is laying a solid foundation for long-term socioeconomic development. I'm quoting the words of the Inter-American Development Bank in 1983, before it was barred by U.S. pressure from contributing to these achievements. In contrast, it is responsible journalism for James Lemoyne of the New York Times to denounce the Sandinistas for the bitterness and apathy that he sees in Managua. Those who hope to enter the system must learn that terror traceable to the PLO, Gaddafi, or Khomeini leaves worthy victims who arouse care and concern but those targeted by the United States and its allies do not fall within this category. Responsible journalists must understand that a grenade attack on Israeli army recruits and their families, leaving one killed and many wounded, deserves a front-page photograph in the New York Times uh, and a substantial story, while a contra-attack on a passenger bus the day before, with two killed, two kidnapped, and many wounded, merits no report at all. Category by category, the same lessons hold. Throughout these lectures, I have been discussing some of the means of thought control and the reasons why these measures gain such prominence in democratic systems in which the general population cannot be driven from the political arena by force. The discussion may leave the impression that the system is all-powerful, but that is very far from true. People have significant capacities to resist, and sometimes do, with great effect. Take the case of the Western-backed slaughter in Timor. The media suppressed the terrible events and the complicity of their own governments, but the story nevertheless did finally break through, reaching segments of the public and even Congress. This was the achievement of a few dedicated young people, literally about half a dozen, people whose names will not be known to history, as is generally true of significant actors who have changed the world. Their efforts did not bring an end to the Indonesian terror or the Western support for it, but these efforts did mitigate the violence. Finally, as a result of their work, the Red Cross was allowed limited access, and in this and other ways, tens of thousands of lives were saved. There are very few people in the world who can claim to have achieved so much of human consequence, and the same is true of many other cases. The United States is a much more civilized and decent place than it was 25 years ago. The crisis of democracy that so terrifies elites is very real, and the effects on the society have been profound and extremely healthy with regard to a wide range of issues, racism, environmental concerns, feminism, intervention, and much else. There was no protest when John F. Kennedy sent the U.S. Air Force to attack the rural society of South Vietnam. In contrast, Ronald Reagan was driven underground to clandestine terror in Central America. The climate of opinion and concern had changed outside of elite circles and the capacity of the state to exercise violence has been correspondingly reduced. The toll of Reaganite terror has been awesome. Tens of thousands of tortured and mutilated bodies, massive starvation and disease and destruction, hundreds of thousands of refugees, and much else. It would have been a great deal worse without the constraints imposed by an aroused population which had found ways to escape the system of indoctrination and had found the courage and the honesty to act. These are no small achievements, again on the part of people whose names will be lost to history. There are ample opportunities to create a more humane and decent world if we choose to use them.
I began these lectures with the questions raised by the Brazilian bishops about the problems of democracy and the media. Perhaps I may close with my own conclusions about these matters. The professed concern for freedom of the press in the West is not very persuasive in the light of the very easy dismissal of even extreme violations of press freedom in U.S. client states and the actual performance of the media in serving the powerful and privileged as an agency of manipulation, indoctrination, and control. A democratic communications policy, in contrast, would seek to develop means of expression and interaction that reflect the interests and concerns of the general population and to encourage their self-education and individual and collective action. A policy conceived in these terms would be a worthwhile goal, though there are pitfalls and dangers that should not be overlooked. But the issue is largely academic, viewed in isolation from the general social scene. A democratic communications policy can be approached only as an integral part of the further democratization of the social order, dissolving the concentration of decision-making power in the state corporate nexus. Such a conception of democracy, though so familiar from earlier years that it might even merit the much-abused term conservative, is remote from those conceptions that dominate public discourse, hardly a surprise given its threat to established privilege. Human beings are the only species with a history. Whether we also have a future is not so obvious. The answer to the question will lie in the prospects for popular movements dedicated to values that are driven to the margins within the existing social order, the values of community, solidarity, concern for a fragile environment that will have to sustain future generations, creative work under voluntary control, independent thought, and true democratic participation in every aspect of our social, economic, and political life. The 1988 Messy Lectures by Noam Chomsky, Institute Professor in the Department of Linguistics and Philosophy at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston. The Massey Lectures were produced for ideas by Max Allen with Lorne Tulk, Brian Hickey, and Ken Mackay and Bob Lackey. The Ryerson panel was moderated by Stuart McLean with Peter Worthington, David Frum, Margaret Daly, Gene Allen, and Kevin McMahon. I'm Lister Sinclair.